Hello and welcome to the debate. I'm your host, Sana Makbul, with you at PTB World. Of course, uh, with me are Farooq Batafi and Raja Faisal. In today's show, we're going to be taking a look at two important developments. One is with reference to what the caretaker prime minister has spoken um, in his uh, meeting with foreign media. A number of issues, of course, came under discussion, including the kind of challenges that the caretaker setup is facing, both politically and economically, and then, of course, at the foreign front as well. Uh, regarding uh, the situation in terms of where the country stands and what is the what is going to be the major role that the caretaker setup is going to play. He emphasized that the caretaker setup is there for the conduct of the general elections as per the constitution, which of course also outlines the fact that new delimitations are in order after a new census is in. Uh, he also spoke about the kind of economic challenges that exist, uh, something that we'll also be focusing uh, more closely in our next segment, but we're going to take a look at what the PM also emphasized is going to be a positive development coming in from friendly countries and points towards um, a two to five year plan that is going to bring in huge numbers in the country. Um, with reference to what is going on regarding the law and order situation, the uh, Prime Minister also spoke about the kind of efforts that are underway to bring peace in the country, especially with regards uh, to the increase in terrorist activities within Pakistan and the kind of relationship that Pakistan has uh, with Afghanistan and how that needs to be something that needs to be focused on and also the fact that the, the kind of external powers that were in the country uh, have left that but it is us that we have to deal with a lot of the issues that are of course pertaining from that and we enjoy our historical relationship with the country and so we're going to be um, working towards a positive development on that front as well. There is of course also a discussion on a number of other issues uh, given the kind of mandate that the caretaker setup has uh, particularly in terms of the kind of direction that the country has to take where the Prime Minister emphasized that mid-level reforms are on the agenda so at least there is going to be some sort of direction that is going to be set by the caretaker setup uh, for the future governments to take forward and there's going to be um, a, a move in terms of uh, eliminating um, as much hindrances as possible towards uh, political and economic progress which is what is going to be the focus of the caretaker setup so we'll talk in more detail regarding what the prime minister also spoke about and what sort of efforts can possibly be underway given the limited time period that the caretaker setup has and the kind of challenges that it is faced with. Our next segment is going to take a look at the economic situation as well with reference to the challenges that we face and especially in particular a uh, focus on uh, the SIFC which is uh, developed as a platform and as a strategy to bring in more investment in the country. Uh, we've seen that the uh, Chief of Army Staff has met a number of businessmen um, in various cities including in Karachi and in Lahore and is engaged with the business community um, in lengthy meetings discussing the kind of efforts that are underway under the SIFC where he emphasized on different task forces uh, taking a look at multiple challenges that the country faces in order to bring in more investment and then also talks about uh, big numbers coming in from friendly countries such as that of Saudi Arabia bringing in 25 billion dollars investment in the country also included of course uh, is the investment on the on the rise uh, from the UAE uh, which is also expected to bring another 25 billion and in all uh, the COS is hopeful of about 75 to 100 billion dollars coming in uh, from the UAE Qatar Kuwait and Saudi Arabia and the next two to five years and this is important given the kind of challenges that the, uh, that the country is facing um, and is potentially also going to be facing in the coming years where such uh, inflow in the country is going to be very very important at the same time a number of candid discussions uh, uh, reportedly have also taken place on the kind of hindrances that exist uh, taking in the input from the business community who are of the opinion that if even half of these measures are actually put into place the country can be put on a path of better progress so we'll discuss in further detail what exactly is the route that is going to be taken by the SIFC um, and discussed measures especially with reference to the IMF and the plans moving forward since reportedly the COS has also pointed towards a future where we don't have to go to the global lender. So this is what we're going to be focusing on at the end of the show today. Uh, before we begin our discussion on our first segment regarding the Prime Minister's engagement with foreign media, let's take a look at this package. On 4 September 2023, while addressing the foreign media, Prime Minister Anwarul Hakkakar stated that Pakistan's security situation has gotten worse as a result of the use of weaponry and military hardware by militants that the United States and other foreign forces hastily left behind in Afghanistan. The leftover gadgets by US and its allies uh, in Afghanistan should have been handed over 
to an entity which could have been responsible. Fighting capacity of these outfits has been enhanced. This is a challenge which probably was not well thought of. And this is a challenge which needs to be responded. Over the past year, there have been many ups and downs in the relations between Pakistan and Afghanistan. The main Afghan-Pakistani border crossing at Torkham was closed in February 2023 by the two sides, leaving both travelers and vehicles transporting supplies stranded. After a week, the border was reopened and Afghanistan's foreign minister Muttaki's trip to Islamabad was scheduled after a Pakistani delegation traveled to Kabul for talks on the problem. Amir Khan Muttaki, the Afghan foreign minister appointed by the Taliban, and Bilawal Bhutto Zadari, the former foreign minister of Pakistan, held a candid and in-depth exchange on key issues of mutual concern including peace and security as well as trade and connectivity, according to a report from May 23. The agreement aimed to increase bilateral relations, fight terrorism and strength in bilateral trade. Unfortunately, the security dynamics post-Afghanistan and Pakistan talks did not experience any improvement. The TDP armed group that is affiliated with and supposedly protected by the Taliban in Afghanistan have recently increased their deadly attacks across the country, raising concerns in Pakistan. Islamabad over the last few months have been pressing the Taliban in Kabul to take immediate action to control anti-Pakistani organizations like TDP, which has increased attacks on Pakistani security personnel recently. Well, you heard what was discussed, particularly, of course, uh, with reference to the situation in Pakistan um, and the kind of relationship that exists with Afghanistan and the potential to move forward for more peace and security within the country. For this, we've also been joined online by Mr. Mushtaq Yusufzai, who's a senior journalist. Thank you very much, Mushtaq Saab, for joining us and being a part of the debate. And I'll start with you, given the fact that a lot of emphasis was placed um, in this conversation um, on the kind of uh, military equipment that has been left behind. And I want to understand uh, the sort of dynamic that this brings in the situation. Uh, we have, of course, previously talked about various other angles, uh, but this is also an important aspect to discuss in terms of the kind of um, impact that this has created in, in the scale and frequency of attacks, both within and outside of Afghanistan and then, of course, uh, in Pakistan. And then also in terms of what really is the measure then, um, given the fact that this is something that is being emphasized now is the responsibility or was the responsibility of those uh, to whom this equipment belonged to. But at the moment, after the withdrawal, and we're, we're, of course, talking now after more than a year of withdrawal, that this is something that is, that is being discussed. How exactly do you look at the situation and you think that it needs to be handled? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Right. My, my question, Mr. Aksab, with reference to what is going on um, uh, when we talk about the situation, given the kind of uh, rise in terrorist activities in Pakistan is also pointing a lot towards safe havens in Afghanistan. I want to know, given the fact that the conversation that the Prime Minister uh, had with foreign media centered a lot around the leftover military equipment uh, that apparently is uh, contributing towards the scale and frequency of such attacks, I want to know exactly how much do you think uh, the situation um, uh, given the situation that the impact exists uh, uh, because of such equipment? And then where is the onus given the fact that we're now at a point where this, uh, the, the U.S. troop withdrawal happened more than a year ago? Yes, Mr. Aksab, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, Mr. Aksab, the question is for you. Can you hear my question? I don't think Mr. Aksab is able to hear us, but Faisal, let, let me come to you with the same question. I'll come back to Mr. Aksab later. Yeah. Uh, Sana, if we obviously look at the situation, the situation is very dire. And uh, remember, we have been uh, talking about it uh, since the day one, that of course, uh, uh, it was uh, perceived that uh, around $80 billion uh, worth of uh, the arms, which were uh, considered as the leftover arms uh, by the Americans in uh, Afghanistan, that was a constant, uh, you know, a ticking bomb for uh, the whole region, including, of course, Pakistan. And and sadly enough, of course, that uh, them weapons slowly and gradually, I don't know how, but somehow they are getting into the hands of uh, miscreants, hands of uh, terrorists, uh, hands of uh, TTP, BLA, and they are eventually using them weapons against Pakistan. How do they get to them and who's selling them? Is somebody from within uh, the Taliban regime involved in it? 
if they are involved in it, then uh, what about the top uh, leadership of Taliban? Are they on board? And if they are on board, then what do they want in the region and what kind of relations they want with Pakistan? These are the questions they need to be asked and uh, their answers should be delivered to Pakistan because eventually them weapons, they are being used against Pakistan. And uh, if we talk about the coordinator, uh, coordinated, uh, uh, you know, uh, the coordinated uh, approach which uh, Prime Minister Kakar he highlighted, he rightly pointed out. Of course, uh, we know the troubled regions uh, of the world. If we talk about the landmines and these sort of uh, uh, you know arms, which are all uh, always used against the innocents, um, they do uh, require a prompt action by multiple countries and responsible countries and United Nations ensures it. And I think this is uh, where uh, United Nations, it needs to play its role and it needs to make sure that uh, the points which are being raised by Pakistan uh, regarding uh, these arms getting sold to uh, the terrorists, they need to be looked into and probed plus then uh, any adequate uh, you know uh, um, any adequate approach should be made towards it because that's how it can be resolved right um mushtaq saab can you hear me yes i can hear you all right mushtaq saab my question when we take a look at the situation um given the fact that a number of factors as faisal has pointed out um, move towards the responsibility or the call for action from the Afghan Taliban regime. I want to know when we speak about the, the roles and responsibilities that the Afghan Taliban regime have to play, especially with regards to the leftover military equipment in the country, what exactly can we expect from them? And based on what premise can we expect this from them? And based on what sort of consequence can we expect this? Because this is something that, that is happening and um, unfortunately has been there for quite some time now. Where do we start in terms of engaging the Afghan Taliban towards any sort of responsibility in this? Yes, Mr. Aksab, can you hear me? Yes, uh, I guess, uh, Portion of your question, but I got it. Uh, actually, uh, you know, that in Afghanistan uh, since 2014, when uh, military officials well, the other one died against them in North Afghanistan. So, all the military from North Afghanistan, South Afghanistan, Rajawar, Bowman, and the Malakan region. Afghanistan. But uh, they could be focused on the training and uh, equipment when they arrived uh, the Americans uh, were planning to use. And uh, Staff 1, 2, Staff 1, 3, Staff 1, selling the arms. We got, we got uh, you know, Rangers, uh, Pakistan, Taliban, the Pakistan, two years had heavily invested in uh, getting these arms. And Taliban used these modern gadgets uh, earlier. Uh, it was close to Bala, but it was Peshawar. And now the capital has to look out all these modern gadgets. We should have these. Uh, But uh, yeah. always talk about Afghan Taliban take action against the Pakistan Taliban. I don't think because what the Taliban could do, they have already done. And uh, we know that uh, there are more than uh, 20 to 25,000 fighters that we have been told by the Pakistan to do okay. And uh, I don't think that uh, Afghan Taliban would take any risk to, uh, to, to uh, you know, take action against them or to, okay. uh, to, to fight against them just because they are in Afghanistan. Right. 
Absolutely, Mr. Asab, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this further. I'll just come back to you. Given the fact that uh, um, when we talk about the Afghan Taliban regime, Farooq, this is important, especially in terms of how we keep on talking about engagement. <laughs> um, again, something that the Prime Minister has also referred to in terms of coordinated approach. But I want to know, um, given the kind of situation we're in and, and, and the kind of uh, actions or lack thereof that we've seen previously from the Afghan Taliban regime, uh, will this be um, the right way forward or is this a good idea to keep on engaging on this, especially given the fact that um, despite so much time uh, uh, being passed on, um, there still d doesn't seem to be any sort of effort coming in uh, in terms of protection uh, of uh, the terrorists using Afghanistan against uh, Pakistan or any other territory. Right, uh, Sarah, uh, to answer uh, that question, what other options do we have? We can uh, certainly blockade the Afghanistan's borders, right? Uh, you know, Afghan Taliban, uh, we can blockade them. But what else can we do? Uh, this is the argument that I, I kept on making when the, uh, the Afghan uh, government had not fallen and when Taliban had not actually taken over. That be aware of the option that you will have if Afghan Taliban take over, right? Uh, one thing that is great is that the Prime Minister actually is very clearly speaking on this matter. And I'm, I'm grateful that he has very clear ideas, uh, thoughts about uh, terrorism. And I know it uh, for the past 10, 15 years, uh, ever since I've been interacting with him. Uh, unlike some of the previous Prime Ministers, he understands what is at stake. Uh, but uh, recently, uh, a couple of months ago, I was in uh, Balochistan and we were taken to the Chaman border as well. Uh, the first thing that strikes, to, uh, strikes uh, you know, and stands out to you uh, is the, the kind of gear that your side has and the kind of gear the other side has, mm. right? They, uh, they are half uniformed or uh, ununiformed soldier who's standing on the other side is actually carrying far more advanced equipment. And then that actually takes me to the question, how best to actually get uh, Western weapons, to cooperate with them or to fight with them? Mm -hmm. If you fight with them and if they, you wear them down, eventually you can get that kind of weapons, right? Uh, the biggest problem right now is that we don't have the kind of leverage with Afghan Taliban. In fact, when we say that we have to coordinate, there is something amazing happening. Uh, whenever Pakistan c c catches a terrorist uh, uh, who might have come from Afghanistan, what happens is that we are actually given from the other side of the border some picture of some uh, somebody who might be there uh, of Pakistani or Trajan who's sitting there, and they just catch him and present him as terrorist as well. So it is no more a cordial relationship, it is confrontational, and it will keep on, uh, you know, increasing in toxicity. And this is the biggest problem now we have. Faisal was talking about the question uh, regarding weapons being sold to these people, right? TTP and other such groups. Mm. Let me remind you what used to happen when Afghanistan uh, actually had ISAF presence. At that time, if you remember, the g or so for that matter, NATO uh, route was quite uh, important and everybody used to talk about it. But we knew that all the caravans that used to enter Afghanistan would first be searched by uh, Afghan Taliban and they would actually take out a very important gear like uh, night vision, uh, web advanced weapons and all uh, from all those containers. And those would be sold in Pakistan on, on street, uh, street corners, right? And that continued for quite some time. So that has been happening there. Mm -hmm. But to think that uh, TTP buys something from black market, not from Afghan Taliban, is to kid yourself. Because when uh, Afghan Taliban took over, and then we were ne negotiating with TTP, and Afghan Taliban were facilitating <coughs> that process, do you know where uh, our MPs and other negotiators, negotiators used to meet mm. these people? In Kabul's, uh, uh, you know, messes, which were actually vacated by the Americans or the Westerns, right? So all of this continues, and unfortunately, we don't have the kind of, uh, you know, leverage with them now. So what you have to do is you have to use all possible 
a mechanisms of diplomacy, not a bilateral diplomacy, by the way. Afghanistan needs money. Afghanistan needs some kind of uh, international support. You cannot actually give them that. Uh, we already have actually almost bankrupted our, ourselves in helping them. But what you can do is ensure that nobody actually gives them more support till that time they start supporting and fighting terrorism, uh, supporting Pakistan and fighting terrorism. Right, but in terms of um, uh, the kind of consequence that can potentially exist in, in terms of what you're saying that no one gives them the support, it, will that be enough for them to actually, will that be enough incentive for them to actually do something about it? Yeah, it is very difficult to talk about a group that has actually existed, uh, existed um, on the periphery between, uh, you know, terrorism mm. and political adventurism. Uh, but the, uh, and you don't know whether they have the kind of compassion for their own people or they would want them to suffer. But there are ways to actually put more pressure on them. Okay. Uh, the, the biggest problem then is that Afghan culture actually uh, bolsters the idea of weapons and use of weapons, right? And that becomes a problem because when the West was here, we knew that there, was, uh, there were attempts to modernize them, right? There was a society within society that was being modernized. It is no more there. Most of them have fled the country. So now the idea of decommissioning or convincing them to decommission people who are identical to their philosophy or their methods becomes very difficult. Right. Um, Mishtaq Sahib, uh, given the current scenario and, and, and the fact that we um, unfortunately don't seem to be having any other option in term, uh, instead of engaging with the Afghan Taliban regime, so then I want to understand what do you think will is the major obstacle or the major challenges that need to be overcome when we do expect something from the Afghan Taliban regime? How should Pakistan be approaching this problem to them um, in a way that maybe hasn't been done so far, um, where we can actually then explore ways in which the Afghan Taliban regime will respond, be it for whatever reason, but they will respond in a way that is beneficial for us? You know, the Afghan Taliban uh, don't have other option. They have uh, to cooperate with Pakistan because they believe that they're depending on Pakistan. Still, Pakistan is hosting more than 3 million Afghan refugees uh, in Pakistan. And even then, uh, many countries uh, in, in uh, Afghanistan neighbors uh, have refused to accept them. And most of the Afghans still coming to Pakistan uh, Wachaman and Torkham because of their, their patients, they don't have doctors, good medical facilities, and even uh, the Pakistani institution offered them admissions. And Pakistani institutions, and the same piece, uh, the Pakistani students are paying. So Afghanistan now that uh, they have to depend on Pakistan. But even then, they have some complaints against Pakistan as well because when I speak to the Taliban, their members, they complained that uh, Pakistan is expecting us to help them uh, resolve this issue, the TTP. But at the same time, we also have uh, concerns about Pakistan, and they suspect that uh, U.S. drones are actually flying from uh, Pakistani bases, and they are flying over Afghanistan. So it's a very complicated issue. And as mentioned, uh, they don't have the capacity right now to take any confrontation uh, to, to engage or to challenge the TTP fighters. And I must tell you that, uh, you know, the TTP uh, is now joined by many Afghan fighters because we know that the Taliban, uh, they had dead many fighters, there were thousands of people, and they couldn't accommodate all of them, and the uh, Taliban army, the police, and other government uh, organization. So they are jobless, and they came to the TTP. And uh, recently, the Pakistani security authorities, uh, you know, claimed to have killed a number of Afghan uh, Taliban. They were fighting alongside the TTP militants in Khyber Tribal District, in Bala, and in Peshawar, and in Balochistan. And you might remember that the Pakistani authorities asked the Afghan ambassador in Pakistan to take these bodies because they were up ones. Right, absolutely.
Absolutely. So, Mushtaq Sab, then I want to understand in your conversation, as you are saying, um, uh, this expectation uh, that they believe that Pakistan has. Do you think that this is in any way out of place, uh, given the fact that the, that the TTP is using safe havens from Afghanistan? There is military equipment coming from Afghanistan. There are Afghan Taliban um, uh, soldiers or uh, uh, men in, 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 in terms of the groups within Pakistan as well. And so, isn't this a problem that is also Afghan Taliban's? No, they are no, not. actually the Afghan Taliban. As I mentioned, there were thousands of people in the Afghan Taliban, and uh, many of them are jobless because they didn't have proper education. They don't qualify for government jobs, so they are jobless. And uh, according to Pakistani security authorities, they came to the TTP because they had close relations before they took part in. Uh, fighting in Afghanistan against the U.S. and NATO forces. So now the jobless, they came to the TTP and Right, but Mushtaq Sahib, I understand that. But I, what I want to know is whether or not our expectation for the Afghan Taliban to contribute in the problem of the TTP is valid, in your opinion. Uh, Unfortunately, we're a, unable unable to hear you. So yeah. Thank you very much for joining us, though, and being being a part of the discussion. Fortunately, we've lost uh -huh. contact with him. But um, Faisal, similarly, um, when we take take a look at this discussion, I, I wanted to know his perspective. But yours is also welcome in terms of what exactly then um, is the understanding by the Afghan Taliban regime? Do they really think that this is not their problem? The well, TGP is not their problem. Well. Uh, 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 you know, here is the uh, statement, and that is, of course, they keep on uh, uh, telling Pakistan that Pakistan uh, should be considering sitting down with the TTP and negotiate. I'm uh, quoting, of course, uh, Amir uh, Muttaki's last week's comment in which he said in uh, uh, one of the interviews, he said that uh, he wants Pakistan and TTP to negotiate on the table. What do we negotiate with the with the murderers? What do we negotiate with the with the terrorists? Of course, uh, day and night they are conducting their activities in Pakistan, and they are buying weapons from within Afghanistan. From whom? Of course, from the people who were powerful on the day when Taliban took over, Taliban regime took over the Kabul, and of course, in all of uh, Afghanistan, wherever these kind of uh, you know tiny depots were who was controlling them at that day. Mm. And one more aspect, uh, Sana, I wanted to uh, highlight earlier as well, and I forgot, and that was, of course, related to, we should not be forgetting, that India had a lot to do with uh, the previous regime. And, of course, they had a sort of, uh, you know, uh, a ground setup to invest all of that, uh, uh, you know, weaponry, how to buy it, where to buy it, and how to uh, give it, in the hands of TTP or BLA to conduct uh, any kind of activities within Pakistan. Now, biggest question is, if TTP is buying from somebody uh, f uh, in Afghanistan, who's paying for it? You know, who's paying for it? Of course, I don't expect Taliban to pay for it because they themselves, they say that, of course, uh, they are, uh, you know, facing problems to run their own affairs, their own, their own regime. Somebody from outside is paying for it and we know that in 2021 India was in talks with the Taliban that they wanted their Jalalabad consulate to get back. Jalalabad, why? Because it is very near, of course, to the uh, border of right. Pakistan and according to my knowledge, at the same time, they have been recovering their, uh, uh, you know, equipments from there as well. That, of course, was related to computers and all of these things. Okay. They were recovering from there. All right. At uh, the, uh, you know, at the, at the same mm -hmm. time, uh, just one thing I want to mention. Okay. We need to probe who's paying for it. India is behind it. If India is behind it, then where are Taliban? Are they asleep? 
All right, I'll, I'll, I'll come to you, Farooq. Let me just introduce our guest for our next segment and uh, welcome him in the debate. Dr. Hakan Najib is a senior economist, joined us online. Thank you very much, Dr. Hakan. And we'll just conclude our topic regarding the situation in Afghanistan. I'll come back to you. Uh, Farooq, the, the, the aspect that I really wanted to get an answer to is something that I st I'm still not clear on, is why the Afghan Taliban regime will help us regarding the TTP. Do you have an answer? Right, uh, Sana, and that is a good question. By the way, I should compliment you your judgment and your, uh, you know, effective mode of control in the program. Yeah. Thanks. You brought in a guest uh, who's a friend also, yeah. and now you expect me to actually uh, speak quickly right, uh, <laughs> yes. on this matter. But uh, regarding what um, uh, Faisal was saying, number one, uh, we have to actually look at what are the, uh, what exactly is evidence. We keep on actually talking about these, uh, you know, imaginary things that might or might not happen. Uh, uh, Pakistan had a very effective case against TTP, uh, India's sponsorship of TTP, mm. uh, uh, you know, before the Afghan Taliban took over. But now we clearly see a kind of pattern emerging where all these ideological twins are together. And I don't think that it is easy to believe that Afghan Taliban would essentially be selling weapons to TTP, right? Mm -hmm. Because Afghanistan might have dirt of many things, mm -hmm. but as was earlier pointed out, it doesn't have dirt of weaponry. And because of that, they can actually manage to give away weapons as they want to. Okay. And this is the biggest problem that we have got regarding Pakistan. It is for Pakistan, especially our security establishment, to evaluate what exactly can hurt Afghan Taliban yeah. in a way that they start uh, cooperating. The biggest problem right now is we end up actually uh, confusing Afghan people with Afghan Taliban. That is not true. Uh, whatever you are doing for the Afghan people, uh, may it be uh, tuition or the, uh, university, uh, you know, education, or for that matter, humanitarian assistance. That is there because they are our brothers, mm. because we have historical ties, right? The biggest problem is Afghan Taliban does not care mm. about its own people. So how do you actually handle such right. a group? You find their weak spots and hit them. Right, absolutely. Um, Dr. Hakan Naji, we're going to be talking about the economic situation, given the fact that the Chief of Army Staff has been <coughs> meeting with the business community in various parts of the country, including Karachi and Lahore, and major announcements are coming in regarding um, investment coming in from friendly countries, particularly that of Saudi Arabia, of $25 billion in the next two to five years, including others, and, an, or, and a total figure of $100 billion is being quoted um, from uh, friendly countries in the next two to five years. I want to know, um, how do you see this particular development and whether it's it's enough cause for a celebration given uh, the kind of impact it will have on the economy or do you think that there are certain aspects behind the curtain that we need to be concerned about so sana first of all pakistan's dollar liquidity crunch has to be removed to give comfort on the external side this is extremely important for pakistan there are two ways to do it one uh, is the imf the world bank the commercial flows so these are all the debt uh, creating instruments that we use. So the other side of the coin is that you want to get your exports up, which are non-debt creating funds. Then you want to get your remittances up. Those are non-debt creating instruments. But something that Pakistan has not been able to do well, given the circumstances, given the context, given the uncertainties, and I'm talking about now for a decade, for example, um, has been our uh, investment to GDP ratio, the kind of foreign Pakistan private and Pakistan public investment. So you have to see this in a very holistic manner. Pakistan's um, FDI last year was $1.45 billion. That is down from the average of only $1.8 billion. I've used the word only so that you kind of get a fair idea that this is not something, the kind of quantum that we need to get in. Uh, I remember talking to one of the finance ministers before even I came to work for Pakistan and he was eyeing five to seven billion dollars. I'm talking, you know, Jan Musharraf era when things were happening for us um, um, at a time. And, you know, they were going to US and going to ask for, you know, and, and we discussed it. I, I also said that Pakistan's potential is five to seven billion given the brownfield projects we have and mines and minerals and agriculture and all the other things that we have. So now that potential, I think, has, you know, I, I, I think more 
um, um, honestly, there is a higher potential than the 1.45 billion dollars that we did last year. So there are three types of things that we want to do. We want to get FDI. So we want to put Pakistan on the map from begging bowl to an investing bowl. So in Pakistan is an investing bowl. We have, um, you know, millions of acres that you can use for productive farming. Uh, there is a high potential there. I wrote an article, I keep mentioning rocks and crops, even before the establishment started doing this on 15th of December, 2022. And I'm really glad I published it in the dawn and I said that this is Pakistan's future. I still hold that the low hanging fruit is agriculture and the generational fruit, this what we want to do for the next generation is the rocks that are there in um, um, Balochistan. So now to make all this happen, you need foreign investment, foreign technology, foreign know-how, because we don't have BHP bulletin as we did in um, Australia, which can go underground. So we have to have Barrett, that's a 50% partner. So that's worked out well after a lot of difficulty. SIFC or the establishment's view here is, you can agree or disagree, that the clogged arteries have not let record take happen for decades and then we had to pay up so much. The clogged arteries have not let Pakistan's privatization happen for, you know, uh, almost a decade we haven't had any worthwhile privatization. I can exactly tell you we sold one small company that we owned and that too out of Pakistan in Saudi Arabia, a small construction company. I think it was called National um, Construction Company or something. It was subsidiary of one of those um, a, a bigger companies in Pakistan. We, we have our discos, we have our PIAs, uh, we have our LNG plants. You know, these are the uh, ones we, we want to. So FTI in terms of getting into the rocks of Pakistan, the crops, you know, uh, food sustainability for the Middle East, CPEC too, we haven't had a chance to, uh, 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 you know, even bear any fruit. And that's the problem. We have 40,000 megawatts of nameplate capacity or over 40,000 megawatts and we hardly get to 25, 26 in summers. That is meant for industrial consumption. That is meant for the SEZs to come up. So you need CPEC too instead of them going to Vietnam. I think that's the whole idea. Now the picture sounds good, but the problem is that getting this picture on ground is not going to be a month, year or two years job, but it is going to be a consistent effort from three to five years, but putting, a, you know, um, uh, getting out of this vicious loop has become important. So now we are trying to make, a, a, you know, a, a, a better loop happen. And as I said, FDI is an important component. Domestic private sector investment is also an important component. I've had discussions um, um, uh, with the authorities and they have agreed that yes, we should give as much weightage to domestic and we are seeing something happen on the agriculture going to Pakistani firms and you will hear about it in, in the coming days. So that is also good. The third component is also very important. The public sector investment, Pakistan's public sector investment as a percentage of GDP used to be 4%. I think now it's down to one and a half or two. That is where we stand. Dr. Hassan, I want to understand, uh, given, and I'm glad you pointed out that this is not a matter of uh, days or months because uh, it's important for us to obviously ensure that this investment comes in. Um, and I want to know then, given the scenario of the kind of economic challenges that, that the country is facing and, and the number of problems that the industry keeps highlighting and talking about how businesses keep complaining about the kind of um, issues that they have to face, I want to know how uh, then are we able to bring in investment in the country in, and based on what uh, aspects um, can we offer all of these aspects that you're talking about in different avenues of investment, including foreign and of course private and public sector within the country. Um, I, want to, I want to understand um, how at one, one side when we have so many issues that business community is facing and the industry is facing is that it, investment is also an option. Um, that is welcome and that, that we can actually work on. And how, how do we make it attractive? And Dr. Najib, if you can allow, I'll just uh, obviously attach one of the questions. It is related to, of course, uh, you know, you talked about uh, uh, rocks and crops. Uh, and we know that the $25 billion we're talking about coming from Saudi Arabia, of course, potential. It 
uh, uh, yeah, of course, of course, it includes IT sector as well. We always keep on talking about Pakistan has the potential to earn more than fifty <coughs> billion dollars uh, in the IT sector. Can we expect in coming days that we will uh, sort of enhance our uh, IT products and sell ideas to the world? So let's start with this. What do you expect in the uh, coming uh, months or a year or two years? Look, I will, uh, His Royal Highness came to Pakistan. He said, I want to set up a refinery. I'm talking to you 2019, and we are again talking in 2023. That refinery still needs to be set up. So let's, uh, you know, to kick off, that's something to think about. I think corporate farming interest from Saudi Arabia is also there in Pakistan. Um, the $25 billion that's been mentioned, uh, of course, it has a number of areas that we have to tackle. Uh, it will take a while, um, of course. But the, the marriage that has to happen can now happen easily because His Royal Highness himself says that the bureaucratic hurdles in the country are holding Saudi investment back. Um, if we can uh, kind of, you know, bypass those clogged arteries through a council or um, through a set of people who are monitoring, implementing and moving, um, th then we can think about uh, this kind of money. There is interest in barrack gold, as you know. Um, the Saudis are interested in uh, um, the um, kind of um, some share. You know, right now it's 50 percent with barrack. Um, there is 50 percent with the government of Pakistan and Balochistan split half-half. Maybe that's something of interest. Our airports um, are of interest. Um, our, our LNG plants are of interest. Um, these are brownfield projects. They are on the active list of privatization. Um, and then, uh, you know, talking about farming with the, um, them, then CPEC too. But all these things are now taking shape. Um, uh, we have not heard uh, uh, exact figures that I can share with you. Um, uh, I think they are shaping up. But as you know, there was a delegation from Saudi Arabia which visited Pakistan. So there were, you know, talks. They are, uh, you know, trying to see. I think the establishment is trying to just, uh, you know, create a continuity. They are going to be there forever. It's civil or military bureaucracy. You know, uh, uh, people like us as policy makers come and go as well. People uh, uh, like the politicians come and go as well. But the establishment is always there. And their passing of the baton is much easier than the passing of the baton um, on the political arena. So I think that's what they are trying to do. I mean, you know, here I think it is not important uh, what we are going to do, but how we are going to do. Um, I think we want to create a virtuous cycle. Everyone has to believe in that. Um, running a vicious cycle in the country where we are, you know, kind of going down, down, down has to at some stage stop and people have to stop dollarization and have to think about investing in Pakistan currency, whether that's in manufacturing or, you know, improving their um, um, agriculture produce in the country. I think that's the whole idea. So creating a kind of an ambiance um, in, in the country. Is it going Absolutely. to be easy? It's going to be easy. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, Dr. Hakan, there's also a report uh, coming in uh, with the COS claiming that we, of course, need to uh, get away from the global lender um, and not go back to the IMF, which may, uh, uh, of course, uh, make sense in, in the much larger sense. And that is perhaps the ideal that we're hoping for eventually. Uh, but does that also mean potentially that we can avoid going back to the fund after the standby arrangement? So let's think through, you know, as I've said, you have the debt creating instruments. In those, instead of using the uh, IMF, you can use project loans, which are much cheaper and have a gestation of 25 years. Let's say for our power projects, um, in terms of the hydro, in terms of the solar. So we should start thinking about green financing. That will give us enough project monies there. You can think of program loans, which is budgetary support, again, long term. So you can start thinking um, about that. Uh, that all... Uh, uh, Sana depends on how our foreign fund flows happen, what kind of debt reprofiling we can do with the bilaterals. Bilaterals are China, UAE, Saudi Arabia, and Qatar. If we can do good uh, uh, reprofiling with them, you know, this burden of 20, 25 billion dollars, half of this is held by the bilaterals. Um, if we can um, move on that, and I think there is a, a sense there as well, um, the rest of the monies can probably flow in from other areas. Plus, if we can pick on our remittances, if the, this de-dollarization starts in the country. So let's see how the next six months pan out. One will be in a better position 
to comment on whether the SBA is something we can, should, um, uh, you know, complete and then move on, or whether there'd be a need to do another IMF program. Most humbly, I can also put something to you. You can do all these things and be in an IMF program. This impression that has been created in the country that you can only be in an IMF program and you're totally constrained to do nothing else. I mean, they are not stopping us from selling PIA or the uh, RLNG power plants or to do a surgery in the discourse or to uh, have corporate farming with Saudi Arabia or to sell recording. All these things we can also keep doing if a fund program gives macro stability. So let's think through this again in January, February to better have a sense right. and let me see the numbers at that time. Dr. Hassan Ajib for joining us and being a part of the discussion. Farooq, we also know the proposal going in regarding tariff adju adjustment was rejected by the IMF and we proposed another one, but I want to understand um, how uh, how much do you think the impact of the announcements made, uh, such as investment coming in from Saudi Arabia and other friendly countries, will have on the way the IMF deals with us? Uh, right, uh, Sana, I think that the most important thing right now is to right the ship. Hmm. And uh, to do that, uh, you don't have to actually worry about how one factor will affect the other factor, right? Hmm. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, s the most important thing is that we have been hearing about uh, privatization for quite some time. Yeah. Why is it that this privatization has not materialized so far? I mean, uh, we are talking about now decades and hmm. reforms as well. The biggest problem lies with the way our state and economy have been structured. The first thing that is structured is uh, we inherited a colonial structure or state, right? Uh, which would essentially be extractive. And then Bhutto Saab came and tried to actually give it a socialist uh, appearance. Mm. So we are caught between these two highly contradictory situations. And we'll have to start fixing that. Right now, I can tell you that, mashallah, because the army chief is so invested, because the government is so invested, General Saeed, General Nadeem, mm. so many people are working on it. I think that we will manage to attract the investment in the country. Okay. But the biggest problem then is that there are so many things that we have to look at, which are SOEs to get rid of immediately. Secondly, agriculture. If you want to advert, uh, uh, modernize agriculture, what are you going to do? Should it be capital intensive or should it be labor intensive, mm -hmm. right? Without that, how can you ensure that it will trickle down? The purpose is to ensure that the people get some, uh, you know, p piece of action, right? right? Some part of action. So with that kind of situation, I think uh, I disagree with Dr. Uh, Hakan Najib okay. that, uh, uh, you know, it might take months or years. It can take minutes if you s uh, start fixing your attitude and mm. you start behaving like a nation. Right. Big ifs, though, but we hope that we are able to do that. But thank you very much, Farooq and Faisal, for joining us. And there's good news coming in, and we hope there's more and that we're able to sustain it to help our people in this dire need. This is, of course, important for the caretaker PM and the rest of the country as well. That's all that we have from the debate. See you tomorrow.